Okay. Right. Okay. Hi. I'm Paul. Welcome back to another episode of Plasma Cast. And today I'm here with another friend, Mr. Hilmi, who off who will be the a producer in Gamika, a software entertainment software company or computer games. Really. Mm -hmm. Okay. And as with Plasma Cast as usual, we cover the story of. Uh, the idea, going from idea to skills to vocation, mm -hmm. and well, Mr. Hilmi here has over twenty years of experience. Yeah, there we go. So he's got a lot to, you know, hopefully help you out there in questions of the gaming industry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so Hilmi, when well, as we, as uh, you know, always with Plasma Cast, I ask, what is was your first ideas to think of? Getting into games. Okay, so my history is a bit weird when it comes to game development because you guys are probably used to people who say that I want to go to games, I go into games no matter what. Right. I didn't. Okay. So what happened was that I was a scholar for a corporate company in Malaysia. And when I got back with a degree, I was supposed to pick where I'm supposed to go. And I decided to go under a university, uh, which was a subsidiary of that company. So the thing is, I have a degree in computer science, and I wanted to go into the creative faculty because, okay, a little bit of the background. Uh, there are two things I like to do as I was young, which is that I like to draw and I like to program. Okay. And back then, in the 80s and 90s, people would tell you that you can either program or you can draw. You cannot do both. Yeah. But that's who I am. That's what I do. So I was always looking for a place where you can actually do both. You can do drawing and then you can do programming. And back then, the field that came up was 3D animation, okay. which was a very mind-blowing thing. The idea that you can use computers to create art. Right. So when I found out that this particular university, uh, MMU by the way, uh, has a faculty of creative multimedia, I wanted in. So during the interview where I was supposed to interview to go into IT or engineering, I said that I wanted to be in the faculty of creative multimedia. Right. So they brought the dean in and he asked me, uh, would you like to be in the games division? So I was 22 at the time, and I was like, oh yeah, because like games, that's like a higher step from 3D animation. It would be awesome to try to be part of something that would build game development in Malaysia. So I said yes. And after I joined the faculty, it turns out that the only people in that department was me. <laughs> so okay, never mind. Uh, I was young, pretty gung-ho about it. And I was tasked to create a game development course. Okay. In MMU. So, yeah, so that's how I got into game development. Okay. By being tasked to create a game development program. So, the thing is, at that time, around 98, within Asia, the only other game development program uh, that existed was in Australia and only found out like three years ago. Mm -hmm. And so, I had no reference of how to create a games course. I just had to figure out, like, okay, how do I get people going to university? to try to figure out how to make games. So my decision was that back then, I was 22, I was nobody, I know computer science, I just love games, but I didn't know anything else. So I decided it would be a good idea to drop by local game companies and ask, how do you do this? Right. And that's what I regularly do. Okay. So just to pull it back a bit, uh, Go on. just pull it back. Uh, you mentioned that, okay, you, you like drawing and you like uh, programming. Yes. At, at, at an even earlier stage. Mm -hmm. Was there an influence, or was there something that you just go and hey, you know, I'll, 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 like how did you, how did, it, how did that influence become so strong on you at such, at that young age? Well, the correct, truthful, short answer is nobody knows. Nobody knows. I don't know because nobody, no one else in my family does what I do. Okay. I would credit my mom because she lets her kids do whatever they want. Right. They want to do martial arts, let them do that. They want to do sports, let them do that. And I was, when I was a young kid, I guess I was easily bored and I decided to draw and it fell on my time, so I stuck to it. And when I discovered computers, uh, because, you know, back in those days, yeah. parents loved tuitions. They find out all these forms of tuition they should try, so you learn how to play the organ, you learn a lot of things. I want to put in computer, computer course, like, yeah, this is great. I, I liked it. So it just turns out that after a lot of things that my mom got me to try, these are the two things that I really love and just continue on my own. Okay. Now, another thing that really formed me when I was young was access to a library. 
Ah, okay. This was before the internet days. Yes. So yes. there was a library in my hometown, which was actually quite advanced at the time. And I only found out like 10 years ago that the head of the library uh, makes regular trips to KL to try to find interesting books to put inside the university. Sorry, okay. in, inside, in, inside, the, inside the library. library. Yes. So when I was growing up, I found a shelf on computer books and they were like a great read because like, I could try out really interesting stuff and I could try it in my school lab and so on. So I guess I just found this avenue of two fields of knowledge that I can develop on my own. So I think one key point I would bring up in an interview is to find something that you can continue on your own without anyone interfering. Yep. And that eventually became my two interests. Mm -hmm. So when it was time for me to figure out where to go for uh, university, and I decided to go for a scholarship in computer science and I started a degree in computer science. Okay. So, okay, so you got the, okay, when you study computer science, mm -hmm. it was it was definitely pursuing programming. Yes. Okay. And back in the, uh, you studied in Vanderbilt University, right? Correct. And that's in the US, wasn't there a program that you could sort of like uh, maybe take an elective or it was, was it available at your university that you could have had that? Maybe slightly earlier exposure? An uh, elective for what? I had a game design. No. Because, no, okay, okay. okay. You, you have to understand this. Uh, back in the 90s, yes. nobody knew how to teach game development. All right. And to be fair, before 1997, okay. the masses were not interested in development. Before 1997, uh, gaming is a niche hobby. Right. It's catered for a small group of people who just like to play with games at home. Right. What changed, and I can say 1997, because what happened was that uh, Sony decided to promote Final Fantasy VII okay. and they did this one bizarre thing. They put the trailer for the game inside the cinemas. Okay. So this is normal now, but back then they showed this incredible epic animated adventure and at the end of the trailer it says, not coming to any cinemas near you. I remember I was in I was in the US in 97, 98 mm -hmm. and I remember seeing it on TV. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, and the tagline is, um, if you succeed, you'll survive. Mm -hmm. If you fail, you can always hit the reset button. <laughs> no, I remember that one day. Yes. All right. So that brought up the public con uh, consciousness regarding games. So then uh, the population of gamers exploded. Right. The, so from these people to grow up to wanting to do game development, that comes in the next decade. Right. So within USD itself, no, there was no courses in game development. And back then, the focus for universities is to train you the fundamentals because they want you to be able to explore other things. Mm -hmm. So going to game development will be a very niche perspective. All right. It's better off for you to learn how to do databases, how to do online programming, how to do AI programming so that you can use this to explore any other avenues. Because back at that time, games is just a product. It's just one way to use programming. Okay, all right. So jump back to where we left off in the story then. Yeah. You're, you're part of the faculty in mm -hmm. MMU. Yes. And 20, at 22, you've been, you're a department of one. Mm -hmm. So, and you went over and you went exploring to the local, to various uh, studios asking, okay, so how yes. might you, uh, how might you structure this? Yes. So can you, well, can you relate more about that experience? Okay. So I was 22, I was young, I was a dumbass. So I got to figure out, okay, I got to do this myself. How do I do this? So. One lesson, which I discovered on my own, but it's something that I tell everyone now, is that your career is based on your connections. Okay. It is very important that you constantly find people to be able to relate to, to talk to, to converse with. Mm. And I discovered by accident, because what I did was, I just tried to find local game companies, rang them up, and said, hi, I'm this guy, this guy, this guy, can I come over and talk? Right. And I didn't just try companies, I also tried other universities as well because there were other universities that wanted to game development as well. Okay. Because it's a very sexy course <laughs> where you just say it and kids will say, I want to be in that program. But uh, university lecturers did not want to engage me. Mm -hmm. And probably because I was young, 22 year old, so they see no value talking with me. But that but that in comparison. When I called up the CEO of Game Brains, which was Brad Lee back then, he was more than happy to see me 
and to explain everything he thought I need to know about game development. Right. And he was willing to do that every time I meet him. I spoke uh, with Kevin Stan of Web.Works Interactive. Same thing. They're willing, he's willing to sit down with me, talk with me, explain how he does game development. Eventually, these people invited me to visit their companies. They allowed me to bring students to their visits. Right. So it was essentially building a connection between the companies doing game development in Malaysia and the students who want to learn game development. Hmm. So what I discovered back then was that among all these companies that are looking for people, game development companies are very open to meeting students right. and speaking with anyone who wants to do game development. I mean, I spoke to one of your, one of your co former colleagues mm -hmm. and he suggested that the reason of this is there's an interest in one is to say give back, yeah. but the bigger picture is to sustain the industry. It's a matter of sustaining the industry. That's a more advanced concept that would probably come up in the 2000s. Okay. Because once people are more aware of what do you need to actually run a company. Okay. Uh, you, you, got, you got to understand that back in the 90s, right? Nobody thinks that they can influence the industry. All right. They're just small companies trying to make do. Okay. And if they cannot sell to one company, okay, nah, just move to another company. Like Game Brains, their, prim their primary customers are the US. They work with US publishers. Uh, Web was interactive. They want to make their own games. Right. So, of course, they'd be happy to get stuff. But the model back then is you hear the company, you send an application, and then if you succeed, you're in. Mm -hmm. So, the, this was before MDEC actually took root. And MDEC exists back then, but okay. there, wa there wasn't this awareness, uh, this uh, zeitgeist of having different members of the industry coming together and says, let's work with each other and bring up the industry. It didn't happen back then. Okay. So back in the 90s, it's just companies being themselves, being silos, giving themselves apart. So the thing I realized is that it's not just Malaysia. This is true in the game industry wherever you go. The people who are running game companies, the people who are becoming directors, producers, designers, programmers, back then, right. did not go through a games program. No. So they had to figure out how to do everything by themselves. Okay. And because they understood how hard that is, they're willing to reach out to anyone who wants to do the same thing. Because it's an opportunity for them to accelerate the other person. Right. Because they know how difficult it is if you don't have help. So back in the 90s and early 2000s, the game industry is full of people who are really willing to help each other. And I discovered that by accident because I went knocking to the door and asking. And I was very keenly aware of that because when I tried knocking at the doors at other industries, it did not happen. All right. Okay. So, so you were knocking on doors and then you finally got this, you got all these uh, contacts willing to lend your, lend your, your knowledge, your support. Okay. And so you have the basis of, okay, maybe I can write this. Mm -hmm. How was the, I mean, you, you finally got some papers to say, okay, we can run with this as a course. Yeah, that's not how it works. But go on. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, 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 okay. I'm, I'm the one trying to dig out the information here. Sure, sure, sure. Go, okay. go on. So, I mean, after much, uh, you know, after much door knocking and conversations, mm -hmm. uh, you kind of got, managed to gel into a program. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, what happened was that uh, in the year that I got into the university, right. I was asked to come up with the games program. Yes. So I was given uh, a template that is another course that I can just, okay, we can choose the course and put it together right. and then try to create a games program out of it. Correct. Now, to be more specific, this is a course that was started by FCM done with collaboration with the IT faculty. Right. So the idea the bosses had was that you get some creative art courses and you get some programming courses, and you mix and mesh, and voila, you have a games program. So when I went through it, what I realized was that there was a component that was missing. Essentially, how do you make sure that these two can actually work together? So during this three months period, I was lucky. Right. Someone came from the UK. His name is Peter Kabalunis. Back then, he was working for a UK company called Drumming Graphics, and he visited the university, I said hi to him, and we agreed to spend a weekend uh, where he was explaining to me how a game studio works, 
what are um, the skills that you need within the industry um, and how do you actually run the studio. So from then, I formalized a set of uh, classes, uh, which I, I call it, uh, what did I call it back then? They're, they're primarily called design classes. Because what I thought back then was that you have programming, you have art, but you need design to right. complement the street. Now, this class doesn't exist. So I got a structure. And I passed it up to university and said, okay, this is the proposed structure. Because naively, I was thinking that, okay, you're receiving something by a 22-year-old. Uh, of course, you know that it's an amateur work by someone who just got into education, who just fresh grad. Right, right. So you're going to check it and make sure that you fix any mistakes, right? They started running the course within a year. They start? Yeah. Okay. So I'm like, wait, you're going to run it anyway. And then there are these courses which I created and no one's going to teach it. No one's going to figure out how to do it. Which is why uh, I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll be the guy, All right. young, gung-ho idiot. Said, I'll do it. I'll be the guy that will figure out how to actually do these game design courses. Okay. And therefore, when the course ran, uh, I became the lecturer for game development. Right. Where you have these components of uh, IT classes, which because they're components of IT classes, they don't need to change at all. And they take components of art classes, they don't need to change at all. So I was trying to figure out how do I bring this together within these design classes. Okay. So that was the structure that uh, I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. Now you note that I'm saying that uh, it's actually a work between the creative faculty and the IT faculty. Sure. So among the lessons that I eventually learned is that UC faculties don't work with each other. Hard. Yeah. They never had, and truthfully, I think they never will. Mm. So. It was initially a program that was running under the creative faculty with the help of the IT faculty. And after a lot of ding-donging between the superiors, it became a program run by the IT faculty with a few um, creative uh, courses thrown in. So essentially what happened was that the responsibility of making the program work goes with the IT faculty. But it's supposed to be a collaboration program. I mean, so there is the assigned responsibility, but at the same time, mm -hmm. It's a course that probably no, neither side knew how to handle. Yes. And I volunteered to be the guy to create these classes that will figure out how will this come together. A lot of bootstrapping along the way. Yes. Okay. So the bootstrapping is a good word because what it means is that you would reanalyze what you did every year. Like, okay, that didn't work, remove that. That seems to work. Let's double that. Okay, we need something here. Let's come up with something. And then you would redo it again every iteration, right? Okay. So. What essentially happens is that every year, I would go to the local companies and say, okay, this is what I have, what can I do to fix this, what can I do to improve this? So the local companies were helping me improve the course. And this was very important to me because in the university, no one knew how to deal with games. All right. So I became this academician who was actually sourcing a lot of help from the industry, mm -hmm. and they're the ones that are helping me build the course, and also because I am actually uh, getting the help how to build the course, I can tell them who's doing what in, in, in the course, like what, what games are they making, so on. Okay. So I'm guessing in return, they get to find out like, who are the students that are worth hiring. Okay. So it's a collaboration between uh, me and also members of the industry. Okay, so after much, uh, well, by the sounds of it, yeah. research, Interaction, traveling, mm -hmm. um, and oh effectively sweat. Oh. Trap. We were talking about Sabajaya, right? Well, back in 2000s. Uh, you know, I mean, by the sound of the effort of mm -hmm. you, you had to invest to get this running. So the evolution of it is that, I mean, the, the other, there's a, probably a side story that you, the, as you mentioned, there was MDAC, yes. uh, and there was also the stakeholders that you, for a there's a bit of a profile that you had to interact heavily with these people, mm -hmm. and in a sense that they were pushing. Uh, sorry, the co go on, go on. I guess the part about MDEC I'm trying to ask here, yes, okay, which is uh, the Malaysian Digital Economy Corporation yes. mm -hmm. of Malaysia. So, they were they the help that you needed, or mm -hmm. were they the you know were they sort of like necessary evil okay how did, so, how did how did their relation help with this okay so 
one thing that I would advise everyone to be careful about, right? Because I hear this a lot, especially when it comes to uh, newspaper interviews, is that people tend to talk about corporate entities as if they're individuals, right? And that's that will put you into difficulties because you will never find out who is responsible for what. Like it's very easy to say the MDEC do this, the MDEC do that. MDEC is not a person. No. MDEC is easily a thousand strong entity where you have multiple people doing different things. Some of them are fighting each other, some of them are helping each other. If you deal with one person, for example, you might go to hell. If you go deal with one person as well, you find out that he's like the best person that you, you needed. Right. And back then, the person that I needed was Hasto. Mm. So Hasto Hadi Samsudin was the one who was very helpful to me within MDEC. Because essentially what happened was that uh, MDEC was trying to take care of the multimedia economy. Right. Uh, so back then they were focusing on animation, which let's put it this way, lah. Since a lot of local companies now are able to create animations that are being sold worldwide, they did a good job. Yeah. They managed to take care of it. Yeah. And they also looked into comics, looked into games. Games were a low priority. But the thing is, I got to know Hasno uh, as a friend. And we never had a professional partnership. I mean, okay. We never signed an MOU, we never signed a contract or anything. But Hasno was the guy who, he has resources. They're not a lot, but they're resources where you can say, okay, make this available to the guy, make this available to that guy. So Hasno knew that I was doing showcases where I was getting students to show off their games to the public. And basically, he just informed me that, hey, we have this space available if you like to use it. Right. So I just said, okay, Hasno, I would like to do a showcase at your place. Um, it will be uh, involving these people. Uh, I would like to do it on this particular day. Right. And he said, sure. And we get to use this premises. It's not a lot because they already have the building. Essentially, if he doesn't allocate to someone, the building will be unused. Right. But that allowed me to actually put my students in the limelight. And all it is is just being able to ask the right person. Okay. So all this door knocking, all this community building, I guess, in a way, uh, it's not just you, it's not just in the one sense you having to build something from scratch, mm -hmm. but also that it kind of evolves into, into downstream opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it's help, whether it's contacts, whether it's resources. Yes. You know, there's always, you know, as you say, networking mm -hmm. is important, not just the fact that you can get your, I mean, you can get work, right. but it's also about how do you sort of like create those opportunities for yourself mm -hmm. uh, you know be it what ambition or dream that you have further yeah okay so many so many years later mm -hmm. um, I mean still this, this program still had its you could say its challenges or the W yeah but then you kind of moved into a different uh, aspect which was uh, game production yes okay so I decided around 2006 that it's time for me to move on right because I've been in MMU for about seven years. The game course is the best in the country because it's the only game course in the country at that point. Yes. And uh, I decided that there was a the point where I really couldn't push myself further okay. in terms of ability. Now, you were talking about ambitions and having a question career. The fact is, I couldn't think of a career back then because there was no such thing as a game career. There was there is no proper path delineating like how would you grow as a game developer? I mean not so much in the I mean that, that statement wasn't so much about okay, how might you like in many other corporate yeah. or technical work there's that yes. there's that set career yes. path where you learn specific skills. Yes. I guess what I'm saying about ambition is or mm -hmm. dreams is okay. You know, quite simply, how might you push it further? Okay, yes. so yeah, I'm gonna follow up with that. So what I was concerned about back then was not trying to follow a career path. Mm -hmm. Because in the creative field, there's no such thing. See, the creative field, people talk in terms of portfolios. Yes. In other words, these and these products that encapsulates your skills. Right. So I was more concerned in like figuring out okay, what more skills do I need? So I can build a game process. I can teach uh, programmers how to make games. Right. I can teach artists how to make art assets. Mm -hmm. I can teach designers how to make game documentations. What next? So I decided to quit MMU. And then, because of my constant discussions uh, with the bosses of game companies, right. one of them, which is Brad Bibby, invited me to join his company. And that's how I became a producer in his company. 
Now, to be clear, a producer is a very high ranking position. Yes. It's a huge responsibility. And he offered me that because he knew what I did for the past seven years before that. In other words, it was easily a seven year long interview. Mm -hmm. And essentially, I kept inviting him to come over to check out my students. Right. So he knew what I could do when it comes to training and managing people. And thus, he gave me the offer. So I accepted. Okay. Because uh, actually, that was my question about, you know, in terms of being that producer. Yes. We'll cover two streams. One is, what does the role encompass? Right. And secondly, is how do you get the role? Because the general, I guess the general uh, thinking that I have right now is mm -hmm. kind of still the linear path, mm -hmm. the linear career path, which you mm -hmm. just broke down. It's, yes. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, so in others, I was thinking, I was thinking in terms of maybe from, you know, the artist to the programmer, to the project manager, and then to the producer. Uh -huh. uh, but as you mentioned, it doesn't quite work that way. Okay. So, uh, but on the other hand, as I said, you know, what goes into that role? Okay. So, right. Now, the thing about being a producer is that it also changes depending on the scale of the company. Okay. Because the role could be said to be interchangeable with the project manager. Right. And that was actually one of the issues with my recent uh, interview. Because uh, the, the company tried to figure out, like, should I be a project manager or a producer? But when we discussed, we realized that we, we don't know the difference between the two. You said the title anyway. Yeah. So you could say that a producer is someone who is managing projects, which is the same thing as a project manager. Okay. But to be more specific, we need to use metaphors. Because in game development, it is essentially an industry that is built on ad hoc practices that solidify with something that seems useful. Yeah. So the metaphor that I use for game development is this. You're building a stage show. Okay. Like a Broadway show yes. where you have actors, you have outfits, you have scripts, you have lighting, you have stages, you have these mechanical constructs that come together to form the town of Les Miserables and so on. Yep. So the, uh, let's see, the artists create assets and these are the clothes, these are the backstage props, okay. these are the actors, these are the lights. Okay. The programmers are the sequencers. That is, they make the prop move. They turn on specific lights. They activate certain cameras. So in other words, what programmers do is that they pick from the assets that the artists make, including the actor themselves, and then be able to bring this up any time. Okay. So they can turn on all the lights in the show if they want to. They can turn on any sound effects if they want to. They can bring up any props in the background if they want to. It's a, so in us, programmers are the very back end, uh, kind of like a back end, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's a back-end, but very critical role. All the roles are critical. Okay, yeah. so, but, uh, so the key thing to the metaphor is that is the understanding that the artist could create anything that will appear on stage. Right. Uh, the programmers are the ones who could make this ready-made asset appear on stage. Okay. Now, obviously, if you throw everything on stage, it will be chaotic, it will be meaningless. That's the role of the designer. The designer is someone who plans out the sequence of how these assets will appear. Okay. And the designer would pass the sequence to the programmer so that they would execute the sequence. Right. And the programmer also wants to make sure that each part is working properly. Okay. If it doesn't if it's not, you can inform the designer and then the designer would change the sequence because oh crap, those lights doesn't work, we have to do something else. Right. Okay. So the role of the designer can be equated to a director in the movie because right, right. the person is directing the play. Sure. It's like okay we have Scene one, scene two, scene three, scene four. Now, what is a producer? In a movie metaphor, mm -hmm. the producer is the one who manages the resources. In other words, they tell the director, you have these actors, you have these stages, we can read the cameras, the cameras are only available within these two weeks, so you gotta make sure that this, uh, you can use only these actors and this prop and the scene. Now you go make the movie. So the, the director, can come back and says, I need this, I need that. The producer is the person who determines what are the resources available that can provide it to this particular project. Okay. Because the producer might have to allocate resources to other projects as well. Because then the producer, in terms of game development, has to be aware of, okay, how many competitors do I have? How many uh, different licenses of software do I have? 
how many artists do I have assigned to what project? Can I take this person out and assign it to a different project and so on? Okay. The goal of the producer is to make sure that every project that is approved has the adequate resources to succeed. Hmm. And if the producer notices that there is a chance that the project might run out of resources, he or she needs to solve that problem before it comes up. Right. So the difference between producer and project manager is that the project manager is managing the project itself. So the goal of the project manager is to make sure that the project succeed. Okay. So they track how the project is running and any problems within the project. The producer takes a step further and determines whether or not the resources are adequate for the project manager to complete it. And if not, they anticipate and says, okay, we'll bring an artist within three months. Okay. We'll bring uh, this particular SDK within two months so that when this project hits this particular point, it's ready for them. All right. So that's pretty much the difference. But if the company is really small in the studio, the project manager and producer is pretty much the same person. Okay. So um, you just highlighted, okay, the producer has a lot. Is a very has still a significant role. Yes. Uh, so the question I want to ask is that while he is in terms of uh, sorry, making making the project right. ensure it's smooth functioning. Yes. Okay. This thing I want to ask kind of related to my to my experience in college mm -hmm. industry. A project there's a certain objective dates, mm -hmm. and then you know breaking it down, we can be they can detect okay what's the progress, what's the yes. Uh, <laughs> What's the progress? Mm -hmm. How the resources are allocated? What are the bottlenecks and such? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, be, I'm at the same time a creative project. You could say maybe it has a bit more flexibility or maybe more fluid. Go on. So, how might a producer, such a you know, manage these things when it's in a way dynamic or in, and you know, anything anything predictable or not could happen mm -hmm. similarly. Okay, so the short answer is you get people who really understand how to manage these unmanageable parts. Yeah. Because the moment you declare that a creative project is dynamic, you got to check, are you saying it's dynamic because you're not sure how to control it? Okay. Because the fact is, when you study the making between, behind creative projects, they're not ad hoc. They're not they're not limited to chance. They can't limit to chance. Yeah. They have to succeed no matter what. Like if you bring a shot somewhere into the jungles of Sabah, no one is going to allocate a lot of money with a chance of failure. Right. So your job as a producer is to make sure that no matter what, there is a plan B, there's a plan C, there's a plan G, there's a plan Z. And then you can deliver something. Right. So the moment you declare a project has certain like right, with certain uncertainties, you create mitigation plans. Okay. And you want to take care of the uncertainties. And this is very general. So the thing about game development is that it is actually very similar to software development and so on. It's just that because it's for entertainment, people tend to drop certain practices that makes these projects predictable. Let's take for example uh, software okay. production. Yep. It's actually not that difficult. You get the parameters for a project, correct? You execute the parameters, and you confirm that the parameters are met, you deliver the project. Correct. And that's what uh, I mean, it's a very straightforward in a way it's kind of straightforward. Right. Uh, so the interesting question is how come it's not so straightforward when it comes to game development? Or maybe why it's not viewed as so straightforward. Right. So here's the thing. Um, what happens in software development is that we reuse components, okay. which makes sense, right? You, make, you have the first version of Microsoft Word, and then when you get Microsoft Word 2.0, you don't rebuild the whole thing from scratch. You use components that, were, that you know worked, mm -hmm. and you fix it with something better. The initial problem that I realized back in the 90s is that when people say they want to make games, what they actually say is that I want to create something new that no one has ever done before, which means there's an idea that they don't want to reuse. They want to be the person mm -hmm. that creates something that no one's ever seen before, which is fine, well, and good. But the moment you declare that you want to make something no one's ever done before, guess what? You have no references. Okay. You have no blueprint. You have no uh, way to confirm whether or not what you do is correct because it has never been done before, which means that particular element should take maybe three to six times longer to do than if you were replicating an existing model. All right. So in other words, any game project that's based on trying to do something new will make it a lot harder. Now, 
Uh, this is something that the producer of WebWorks Interactive explained to me, which I remember back then it was mind blowing. Because it's easy to say, for example, and I do this with my students a lot, because when they say game, I will ask them, what game do you mean? All right. The game model that people like to cite a lot is actually the Western game model, okay. which is basically the idea that you create something from scratch every time. Here's a game. Okay, let's figure out something no one's have never done before. Okay, we create a program for it, we create the art for it, we create the design for it. And because it has no basis, you have to build everything from scratch. And then you gotta put it together and you get it to work. And let's say it succeeds, it makes like a few million dollars. And you want to do a sequel, but then you say, okay, we the want sequel, to do it again. We, we want, want to do, do something again. new again. Yes. So you take nothing from the previous version. Meaning, you have to redo the whole thing again. Right. And if you succeed, that's great. But it's a very expensive process. Correct. Now, at the same time, in the 2000s, right, uh, the producer was pointing out how small Chinese studios were making games. And I, I understood what he meant because you can go to, like, say, Loyat or Inbi uh, back in the 2000s and use these cheap Chinese games. And they're not knockoffs, they're okay. not pirate versions, they're like 20 million versions of games. And they play like a Diablo copy. But the point here is that that game uses a one engine. It would say it's one particular game. It would sell maybe like a few thousand copies, okay. which is not great by US standards. But what happens is that the company will reuse that engine, will get the artist to redraw some assets, will get the designer to retell the whole story, and they package it as a new game. Right. And they sell a few thousand copies, which is not great. But the thing is, what is the development cost? What is the research cost? It, the research cost is nil because it's like the same model that you use for books, the same model that you use for, uh, say, producing comics and so on, where you know your resources, that's the producer where it comes in, okay. you know how long it'll take to re-figure uh, re out how to produce something new using the same tech, therefore you can confirm that it can be done. So it doesn't sell many copies. But compared to the amount of cost that you use, you made a profit. As opposed to, say, let's take a game that came out on the Xbox called Crackdown. Crackdown uh, was uh, priced at, I could be wrong here, but it's $20 million, if I'm not wrong. So that game broke even. It's $20 million and it broke even. You have no profits. Which is better, to spend $20 million to make a game that gets you no profits, or to make a very small game using all technology and you make some profit right so when you talk from a company's perspective you get an idea which one is better so one of the issues that uh, I noticed that people are facing in development is that making a game itself is easy but the moment you want to create something new which is not limited to games okay there's a lot of research and trial and error and mistakes that has to be accounted for in the budget and if you don't do that, you cannot finish it. Right. Okay. One thing I want to ask is that, okay, so many, many years later, when you talk about this, mm -hmm. um, one thing that I kind of noticed is mm -hmm. there's an increasing trend in a certain one or two brands of game engine, which seem to you know, be prevalent in so many other software titles. Yes. So is that an indication of the industry shifting in that direction, mm -hmm. or is it or is there still a lot of, you could say, research, experiment, and bootstrapping? Okay, so no, it's, it's just it's a lot more than just uh, two prevalent game engines. So what happened uh, before that was okay. that some companies uh, would license their engines. Correct. So I'm going to use Unreal. Yes. So Unreal uh, will allow you to license your engine back then, but because the model like back then was that you only publish under publishers who fund your studio, Okay, so back then in the 90s and 2000s, publishers are yeah. people who give you money to develop their games. Correct. So, um, to use Unreal back then, you have to pay 1 million US dollars. To get the Unreal uh, SDK? Uh, yes, and the license on. Actually, okay, let me go back a bit. You, you can actually play with the Unreal Engine for free back then. Correct. Because what happens if you buy a copy of Unreal Tournament, the editor is inside. Yeah. You can use it for free, you can create mods and just launch it. And a lot of people actually did that back then. They just create mods for the game like uh, Red Orchestra. They just modified uh, the, the Unreal game engine. And then it got so popular that they were able to actually create their own game out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the model back then, Unreal 
price themselves really high because they know it's not the studios doing it, it's actually the publishers. Right. And publishers for console games and PC games like that could afford that kind of investment. So that was the model back then. Mm -hmm. Other companies uh, this, uh, tried, decided to try to come in by offering cheaper engines, like uh, the Vicious engine. I remember that for game rates. The, the thing is that because they didn't have the experience that uh, Epic Mega Games had making Unreal, the engines being offered are not as good. Right. So studios had trouble trying to deal with these engines. So Unity was one among these engines because it was originally an engine created for a game project and the owners decided to turn it into an engine that people could use. Right. So that is not novel. Okay. What's novel is the model where they will constantly improve the engine based on feedback of how the users use it. And this is back in the time around, this is now 2010s, and I don't know what to call that decade, the 2010s now. Uh, this back when the internet has matured to the point where it's very easy to get feedback, okay. it's very easy to share code, GitHub came up and like, wow, now you can just download code and just dump it into your game and so on. So we're now seeing this environment where both Unity and Unreal are engaging uh, their customer base in such a rapid pace that innovations within, let me rephrase that, innovations on how to learn, use, and apply game engines are coming at a really rapid pace. Like Unity, for example, upgrades itself every four months. Every four months. Every four months, they have a new engine and mm -hmm. sort of like SDK features and... Yes, it's not a new engine, okay. but uh, the components upgrades itself in really... Okay. Uh, I mean, I have... It, it changes the way you use the engine. Right. Like last year, for example, they bought uh, an, asset, an, an asset called ProBuilder. So ProBuilder allows you to model 3D within the game engine. All right. So instead of trying to build your 3D outside and, and the engine, you can put it inside. Yes. So, see, the thing is, what's major about it is that if you're going to build your 3D stuff outside, put it in a game engine, you need a 3D software, Correct. which is 3D Studio Max or Maya or Blender. Right. So, 3D Studio Max or Maya, expensive. Blender is good, but you got to know how to use it because it's a very independently made software. Yeah, I'm but, aware of Blender. Right. So, that's the workflow. But because Unity has bought ProBuilder, now, bot itself is a game changer because before that, you have to justify, do I buy this software to help me build game development? But because Unity says they're free and Pro Build is now free, now you can say, oh my God, if I use Unity, I can use this workflow. And the particular workflow they have means that a designer can build a whole level in Pro Builder and then they can build like really rough, simple 3D shapes and they can export these 3D shapes to any 3D artist and would, the 3D artists would just improve the model. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the designers are rearranging the simple shapes within the game engine. So the upgrades to Unity changes the way you make games. And Unity is constantly promising new features that would change the way you make games. And this happens every four months. Wow. And so Unreal, being their competitor, has to keep up. Okay. So Unreal is offering uh, free courses on how to learn to use Unreal and they promise new features like Niagara and well, a whole bunch of other stuff. And because it's the competing, right, you know that they will always try to come up with something new, something new, so on. So you benefit by keeping up. Okay. But it also means that the way you make games change pretty much every year. So it's not just offering game engines, it's offering new way to make games. Okay. On the one hand, you're saying that the two, I mean, so on the one hand, you're saying that two, uh, I mean, the few major brands of uh, game engines right. that are competing with each other and there's always new things, new things, new things. Mm -hmm. How might your, I mean, how does the program keep up? Because on the one hand, he's already busy with his pro with the pro with the project on uh -huh. hand, and yet he's, he probably has to upgrade every four months. If the company lets him, if the company trains him, if the company allows for such a person to have the time to upgrade themselves. I guess the in, I, I guess the part I, I, I guess the part that slightly uh, surprises me here is Go on. the intensity to to keep pace and upgrade yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, not 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 just at the developers, not just at the programmer side and the artist side. Yes, but also you as to say, okay, what are the opportunities of mm -hmm. of uh, project workflows that improve with it or changes? Okay, 
there is no simple answer to the question. Yeah. Because, for example, uh, Brian Reckonwald, um, artist for Naughty Dog, he came to give a talk uh, in Malaysia two years ago. So one of the things he pointed out was that when he does his work in Naughty Dog, he goes home, he PMs at home. What does he do? He boots up software to learn what more can he do. So he's actually working nonstop. Okay. Now, uh, crunch is a major issue within, within the industry where people spend too much time uh, doing work yeah. instead of having a life or trying to build a life, getting a family yeah, and so on. Yeah, still a major issue. In yes. But the thing is, uh, you get people at Brand Record Walk, which is a very common creative industry where learning how to be creative is what they always do. So when they go to work, they figure out how to do stuff. When they go home, after they care of family issues and so on, they still spend time uh, learning how to do their own stuff. And the current environment supports that because you can always go to a tutorial online like, okay, so here's your feature called Tiny Bill. Like, what the heck is that? Okay, let me try the tutorial. Okay, fine. I can spend another time how to do it. Okay, within one night, I'll learn how to do something new. Right. So you miss the chance to go to the movies and so on. But there's a lot of people who decide that after I do work for others for money, I'm going to spend time to do my own work. Now, I'm not saying that's a sustainable model. What I'm saying is that the people in the creative industry tend to live for it. Right. And it's not that they have to, they love the opportunity of, okay, I'm just going to start doing something on my own to see what I can figure out. The benefit is that when the company itself wants to do something, like, hey, this is something I've been practicing for the past three months, let me show you what I can do. And it's actually very common. Uh, this is one anecdote told to me by a Singaporean dev working with in Lucas Arts because they work on a Transformers movie. So what happened was that someone uh, from the animation team uh, showed an animation of okay. how a transformer would transform. Okay. So according to the story, is that someone from the simulation department, simulations don't do animations, they okay. just simulate reality effects and so on. This guy apparently was so unhappy with it that he just walked out of the room. Okay. And this is a meeting uh, where the director was there. So people noticed that, oh, what's going on? So like, the guy just went off, and the next day he came back with his own animation. And he's not supposed to do the animations. No. He came in animation and showed it to everyone, and everyone's mind was blown because it was much more incredible compared to what the animation team came up with. And that's the transformation that is standard inside Transformers movies now. It just so happens that the guy whose job not doing animations actually knew a better way to the animations. So he went off at his own time, developed it, brought it back, and now the company uses it. Which is why, and probably now, transformations in transform movies are done by the simulations department. So there's a lot of creative ping-ponging that happens among creative people, where right. someone who is not assigned to do it actually figure out how to do it, and they feed the information back, and then people take it like, oh yeah, this is amazing. Okay, let me show what I can do as well. All this happened during off-work hours. Now, it will be good if this can be done within work hours but how do you plan for that how do you plan for this part how do you plan for people who just want to keep studying no matter what so i like this as the answer but i don't know all right it's one of the difficult parts where we have to allocate like training time within company time how do we do it without taking people away from projects that needs to be finished because that means money coming in and also making sure that people stay sharp and not make it a directive because nobody wants to be sharpened because they're forced to. It has to be something they want to do. So it's, it's not easy. We're in a scenario where within every field, be it animations, be it games, uh, be it rendering, uh, things are moving so fast that if you don't create your own method of keeping up, you will be left behind. Wow, it's scary. Yeah. Okay, so that's, I mean, again, you know, all this is mind-boggling information. Okay, so on the one hand is that, you know, this is the responsibility is this. You are kind of juggling probably like a dozen balls in the air. Like, yeah. you know, three, three is already a challenge to some people who started mm -hmm. on juggling and here you're juggling. You're like, okay, it does help that you have all this experience to mm -hmm. be able to, to understand and uh -huh. manage and execute on all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still... Yeah, like I said, I'm just I'm still surprised to be hearing okay. all this information. Mm -hmm. Okay, so talking a bit further about the industry is that where might you see the landscape of the 
of uh, the industry moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I posed this question previously and it was saying that because of internet distribution that mm -hmm. it has, uh, you know, because of internet distribution and also because of the recent news, triple A's, triple A studios mm -hmm. are always at the risk. And then <coughs> is it time for the indie studios? I don't so to do what? I mean to, to be to share a bigger slice of the limelight. Go on. So the question I'm asking is that mm -hmm. in what is your understanding of where the future may be okay. for game developments? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for, for game development. Is it mm -hmm. the way of the triple A? Is it the way in any? Is okay. it uh, will there be new technologies to influence how things are done? Okay. Or is there a new uh, or is it will there be new ways of gaming? Okay. There will definitely be new ways of gaming. Okay. Definitely. Because people will always experiment and some experiments will stick mm -hmm. and then it will spawn copycats right? and that will spawn genres. That will always happen. And it's what people in the game industry live for actually. Like, we love finding out that PUBG has created a model that is very successful that now any company can emulate and try to do on their own. Right. It's like how uh, the mobile scene came out where Dota came out of nowhere and it created a model that is cur currently generating a lot of money for Riot and many other companies that is creating this kind of game. Right. So one reason that people love being in the game industry is the pace of innovation where there is always something new. And that actually defines the people that are in the industry. There are people who just love finding out, oh my god, what I knew two years ago is useless now, so I don't have to move on. So, okay, context, right? Have you used Photoshop before? Yeah, I've used Photoshop. I've okay, used Photoshop before. I was teaching Photoshop back in the late 90s in multimedia university. All right. So I remember spending three hours teaching students how do you actually select a character out of a photo so you can crop the character out? Okay. So you use the lasso tool, click, 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 yeah, click, click, yeah. click, and then you use the mask tool to actually refine the edges so that it's accurate. Yep. That's three hours. Now it's one button click. It's a feature that Adobe created. It's linked to Adobe Sensei, where Adobe Sensei has studied how previous artists have selected uh, humans. Therefore, now you can. Take a photo and just click a button and Adobe Sensei will automatically select the person inside your photo and it will be accurate. So what I knew, what I worked on 30 years ago is useless. Right. And that's just how industry works. So it's not about trying to hold on by what you knew in the past. It's understanding how the fundamentals of what you know can help you be really, really good with the new tools that are coming up. So if you're asking where the game industry is going, here's the, here's the thing. It's another thing that I ask my students to be very careful about because when you use words, you gotta understand what they mean. When you say game industry, you gotta be aware that there is no such thing as a game industry. Mm -hmm. There is the way the Japanese make and sell games. There is the way the American market makes and sell games. There is the way the European market makes and sell games and they are very, very different. So you can fail in one market and go to another market. There are upcoming markets like the BRICS, which is uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Yeah. And China has been very interesting to deal with because they will make and sell games their own way. Australia makes and sell games their own way. So there is no cohesive idea about how a game industry works. Mm -hmm. That word is too big. Okay. So it comes down to like, okay, what is it about a game industry that you can deal with? Now you mentioned indie. The problem with using the term indie is that there is no real structure of what an indie game development is because indie game development simply means I want to be independent. Okay, what standards do you follow? What structure do you follow? What legal rules are you obligated to follow? What kind of financial models do you follow? So on. It's fine to say I want to be indie and just make my own game, like the guy who made Stardew Valley. Yeah, Stardew Valley. Yes. So that was a success after five years of the guy developing the game on his own. But that was a stroke of luck, wasn't it? He couldn't predict that it would be a success. He was lucky that his girlfriend supported him throughout five years. Can, can you imagine getting a girlfriend like that? Someone who like, oh, you're gonna work on this game for five whole years, I will support you all the way. It really paid off for her because now he is very stable because his game sold millions of copies. But that's, how do you plan for that? You can't. Because indie development is 
independent development, meaning there are no structure. And essentially, you get a group, a group of indie developers, and most will fail, some will succeed, maybe, maybe, maybe one of two succeed very well to continue. As what? As indie developers, as a small company, as a medium company, where the risks become very different. The thing about AAA development is that you have to know what the definition of AAA is. Like we talk about AAA movies, AAA games. AAA means you are developing without a budget. It means that the owners of the IP will do whatever it takes to make sure that the IP succeeds, which is why the marketing budget can be high or even higher than the development budget. Because that particular industry understands that if you don't market your IP to make sure it's part of the public's consciousness, you're not going to get enough money. Hmm. And that is why you get products uh, in fast food uh, restaurants where you have the IP emblazoned on your cup, emblazoned on the t-shirt and so on. Because the game is not make the game and hope it will sell. It's to link the game with the marketing effort to make sure that people know about it so much that they will purchase the IP. And that is something Indies can't do because they don't do marketing. They can't do marketing. They don't have a budget for marketing. Okay. So these are, these are very different. You need to understand how these businesses work. Like the movie industry, for example. It's easy to decide, okay, should I do an indie movie or should I do a triple A movie? But what you need to understand is that a movie studio doesn't make just one movie. Yeah. They make a whole set of movies. They have this one movie that will be the bank, which is usually a triple A movie. And this movie will generate enough money in case all other movies are failures. And that's fine because overall you make a profit. Companies succeed, right? Companies yeah. succeed as long as you make a profit. Now, why would you have this four failures on the movies? In case one of them succeeds, then you can generate an IP out of it. The first Terminator was a sleeper hit, meaning nobody anticipated it was a hit. It was essentially a small budget movie. Mm -hmm. uh, so James Cameron made the movie and he's okay that he's finished. Nobody thought it would be a monster hit. The moment it became a monster hit, it became a triple A entity where people would throw money and marketing to make sure it stays within the consciousness, which is why we're constantly getting Terminator sequels and Alien sequels and Predator sequels because of that initial experiment, which proved to be a success. Okay. Now, you want to talk about indie development? Uh, huh. More like this. Okay, you just, you define that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, you just define that. Okay, that I might be posing the question a bit too broadly, but. So let's pull it back to okay. What do you see the future of it? That mm -hmm. if it's possible, if it's, I mean, if it's even fathomable that such predictions can happen. Indians will be easier and easier to use to okay. the point where you do not need to be affiliated with big corporations to use them anymore. That has already happened uh, with Adobe, because it used to be that you want to use Photoshop, you gotta pay. Yeah, uh, of course, if you're company, you should the pirate. Nowadays. It's a license. You just pick the software that you want and you just use it. At the same time, there are various open source options by people who do not like the fact that they have to pay subscriptions. And these open source options, like Trita versus Photoshop, Blender versus Studio yeah. Max, are really, really good. You just need to spend time to learn and do it. So essentially, the industry, yes, let me see very good work there. The industry <laughs> has moved to the point where regular people have access to industry level software. So finding someone with the skill will not be a problem anymore. Mm -hmm. Especially since now you get school kids who has access to, imagine this, access to Adobe software, access to uh, 3D software, access to Google's AI software. You just apply and you get it for free. Right. And these people will get it when they're 13, 15 years old. And then they have seven years of development time. They'll be really good when they're 22. So the technical knowledge will be more common in the future because it's freely accessible. The hard part is that because it's not so freely accessible, there are many, many people creating products. How do you know which one to invest in? There will be the differentiation is the challenge then. Yes. So that's the problem of the limelight, which is the word you mentioned early on. Now, what's really bizarre to me is that 
the current indie game industry has this scenario where game companies have to promote themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine, well, and good. That's how industry is supposed to work. But game developers are primarily people who don't like engaging people. They can't promote themselves. All right. They chose to work in a creative path because they cannot express themselves easily. And the industry is asking these people to go out and promote. See, the normal procedure is when you work with a publisher, the publisher does the promotion of the advertising marketing. All right? That's why you work with a publisher because they handle the need for charm to communicate, to flirt, to impress people. Where the developers, who are traditionally people who don't engage people, just focus on doing the work. When it comes to indie development, where, okay, tech, not a problem. Get it, finding people with skills, not a problem. But to promote the game, what do you do? And that's why now indie companies are looking for some sort of structure. What is the best way to promote the game when you yourself is someone who is not comfortable dealing with people? So you see standards where you learn how to create promo videos, you learn how to create screenshots, you learn how to create press kits to notify people. Mm -hmm. But eventually when 100,000 companies are doing the same thing, you got to find a differentiator. How do you stand out? Right. And that's bizarre to me. It's like you're telling people who try not to stand out with people to stand out more. So a few will succeed. A lot will have a very hard time. So maybe people will find a way to help them promote. But that's dangerous because you're, you're getting people who are not used to dealing with people to suddenly be at the forefront of dealing with people. And there will be issues, there will be conflicts, there will be a lot of anger and resentment because they're not trained to do that. But as it turns out, if you have lots of competition, that's what you have to do. Right. Okay. Okay. So that's covering the future, of, you know, your impression of the future industry. Yes. Let me get into what I call my three, the three questions uh, where, you know, before I close up the show. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is three, I'm, this is about three pieces of advice that you might give to mm -hmm. someone who's thinking about it. So mm -hmm. the first question is, for someone who is, who has the idea mm -hmm. of being in the games industry or right. being a games educator, I'm, right. you know, it's open to them. Mm -hmm. What advice might you have for these people at the idea part, at the point of idea? Ideas are valueless. Okay. Ideas can be created by anyone. It was very clear uh, when I spoke with uh, like Brad Bibbit, Tyron Stan, is that they don't want to hear ideas. Okay. The value is your ability to turn that idea into something that can be shared with others. That is why artists are easy to hire. They're not hired for their ideas. Okay. They're hired because they can flesh out ideas. So they can show it in the form of a character sketch, in the form of a character animation, in the form of a movie. And these are sellable products. Sketches can be packaged into books that can be sold. You can buy sketchbooks or sketches from other people and they will make an income. You'll find people who are on Patreon now who are only doing character sketches. Right? And they make money because these sketches can be shared. Someone is willing to pay $2 a month just to get a constant stream of sketches. See, the key thing is not the idea. The key thing is, can you create a product out of your idea? Or at least can you give some form, even though yes, at a primitive level, such can you give some form to the idea that Correct. Uh, is viewable or shareable? Yes. The same rule goes for programmers, the same rule goes for designers, the same rule goes for producers, which is why the creative industry is portfolio driven. Mm. You say that you're a good programmer, people will say, okay, show me your programs. What's your GitHub? Let me download some of your code so I can review it. You say you're a good designer, show me samples of your work. Right. So the standard now for designers is that they have to know how to prototype and show the designs. Okay. Because no one will trust a person who says, I have this idea for a game. That's valueless. Okay. Or you can say, I have a good design. Well, you have a document. How do we know it's good? Okay. You have to be able to prove that your proposal or product will work. So that is why now, if you look at uh, essentially uh, interview requirements for a designer, they will put in that knowledge of game engines okay. uh, is uh, recommended. Right. It will be in the future where knowledge of game engines will be required because they would rather deal with someone who can flash out your idea ideas before they make someone else work on it. Okay, next one. 
that I guess you kind of spilled over a bit. Okay. For those who, so you're from idea into <coughs> skills. Yes. For those who are trying to develop their skills, mm -hmm. um, as you say, perhaps mm -hmm. to flesh out their ideas or mm -hmm. perhaps to give some form, what advice might you have for them? Mm -hmm. Develop skills that are not dependent on others. Okay. Like, there is no value in saying that you can come with a good game design if you need someone else to build it for you. Again, this is what artists are easy to hire because they will tell you the requirement is, I just need the software. Give me the idea, I can build any kind of software. They are independent. They don't require someone else to validate your work. Mm -hmm. So you should work on the set of skills where you can utilize it to demonstrate that you can produce something without requiring any, anyone. Because the moment you say that you need someone else, that someone else can screw your career. That someone can say, I don't want to work with this person, and then where are you now? Right. So even within, the, say, art, for example, you can just focus on animation by creating rigs using stock characters and showing that you can do good animation. And it's independent from whether or not you get a good extra artist or whether or not you get a good model. Because you're showing that I can do work and my work is good. You can just take it and put it in part of the product. The same goes with programming because you can just focus on one part of the program. Let's say you work in AI or network programming mm -hmm. or gameplay programming and be able to demonstrate that you can work on that component independently. Then people will know how to value you. So it comes down to picking up the skills where you don't need someone else to prove that your skills are good. Okay. All right. And for someone, and the third piece of advice is for someone who, you know, from my idea, they've, they've gotten their skills. Mm -hmm. What advice might you have for those who are starting out? Start building a portfolio. Because access to the software that allow you to make uh, impressive stuff is free. Right. Especially if you're a student, you get more support as a student now than you do as a working professional. Okay. Tutorials are now free and available to be really, really good. You can find Unity offers really good tutorials, they're free. You have to spend time learning them. Unreal has a tutorial at the Unreal Academy. They're good, easy to use. You'll find out they're limited, but the moment you find they're limited, it's because you understood it so well that you can now do your own things. And that's when you start shopping for other ways to learn. So the practice now is the means to learn is already available. The means to produce and execute is already available. You just need to spend time to learn them and make something out of it. All right. And then once you have that, create a portfolio site, put your stuff in there. All right. Okay. So that's my three questions about mm -hmm. the advice of uh, for those who are starting out. Mm -hmm. Now, last word I give to you. Mm -hmm. Do you have any you know, final pieces of advice or stories or uh, even shameless plug you'd like to put out there for the audience? Well, based on what we've been talking for the past one hour or so, I would say that if you're someone that likes to constantly find out new things, the creative industry is always changing. So it's a fun place to be where you constantly check out, oh, I can do this, I can do that. And you find value by being able to make stuff. So my advice would be is keep making stuff. If you like something, make it on your own. It's not a field anymore where you have to go to university to get a cert and a cert actually proves that you can do it. No. Proof is my portfolio. You like something, go make it. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, that was pretty intense, but mm -hmm. definitely great content. Okay. Okay. So um, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I close out the show. I've been speaking with uh, Bill Me, who is a who will soon be a game producer again mm -hmm. and educator of the of the entertainment software industry. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, thank you very much for watching. If you want to know more or get in contact with him, you can check out his blog at filmyworks.com mm -hmm. or you can maybe write to you. Is that sure. okay? Yeah. yeah. So for that, uh, you know, check out the check out the end slide and look at the description below if you want to know more about his through his experience of what the game industry entails. So with that, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. Okay. <laughs>